All right, let's go then. I was just in a park recording this video. There's no CC Lemon, but there's Picari Sweat and Red Bull. But the weather didn't cooperate. So I've returned to my hotel room. Let's get right back into it while it's fresh in my mind. This is the second part in a two-parter video. The first part of the video, the previous video, was on identifying those core root fears. The consequences we're actually afraid of. So often we focus in on the superficial topic of an intrusive thought, but the thing is that's not what we're actually afraid of. And if that's news to you, this is a really important mental health concept, go check out the previous video. This video, the second part, is on what do we do with that information? So once we've identified what's actually underneath all of those fears, how we're practicing that fear throughout our lives in a way that's fueling those intrusive thoughts, right? They're really an outcome of all of the different ways we're practicing that fear, of all of the experiences we've had around that fear. What do we do with it? How do we go after that underlying fear? The thing is, we don't wanna give more time and energy to that fear. We also don't want to turn it into a new type of contamination to clean away. We don't want to be in a scenario where we're trying to find new compulsions because we want to get rid of that fear, right? So it's still like any fear, like any anxiety, like any uncertainty. If you're trying to get rid of it, you're only going to teach the brain to give you more and more scenarios to be afraid of. So you have more and more opportunities to chase that success you're looking for. At the same time, we recognize how that fear and reacting to it is creating so many problems in our lives. So we do go after it, but we gotta go after it in a kind of roundabout way. We go after it by going someplace completely different. I'm gonna explain what that's all about. There are three steps that I find useful after we identify those core underlying fears. So let's get into them. The first step I take is what I was alluding to there is to flip the direction. And what I mean by that is you look at the fear, which is often about trying to avoid something, trying to control something, and you flip it to something you care about that you wanna grow and build. So for instance, we don't try to fix the fear of people not judging us, we flip the focus to building relationships with people. But obviously, we care about people, that's why we're afraid of them judging us, that's why we're afraid of being alone. And there's a key support to this, so to help with it, Pick something that you could do in life, a direction that you could go. It doesn't have to be the right direction. It doesn't have to be something you'd really like or you really identify with. You know, pick something you could do. So for example, many people could open donut shops. If they struggled with a fear of having panic attacks in front of people, they could flip the focus to wanting to share their donuts with as many people as possible. We know they care about people. That's why they're afraid of being judged. So we make the focus about sharing and building relationships. That's a value. Then we can look at what are the actions that need to happen to move in the direction of that value. That's going to involve a lot of being in front of people. So the second step is to identify the compulsions that are getting in the way. And this is where the logic mountain from the previous exercise is gonna become really useful. Look at all of the checking and controlling going on that you identified on the logic mountain. Also, this is a chance to see even more things, add in more on the diagram that you may have identified once you pick that direction and really look for the ones that are most likely to interfere with that direction that you could go in. So they might not seem like a direct and immediate barrier getting in the way of that direction you wanna go, but if they're eating up all of your time and energy or they're completely exhausting you, then they are getting in the way because you're gonna need that time and energy to go in a different direction in life. Things like that rereading and rewriting messages, it might not seem like something that is directly in the way of where you wanna go, but when you take a step back and look at how much time and energy you spend on that, how much time you spend each day having imaginary conversations with people in your head, pre-writing messages you may not actually send for weeks, all of the time that goes into procrastinating around that, just cutting out a compulsion like that can have such a transformational change in a person's life because you get back so much time and energy because so often 
having those imaginary conversations is just making us miserable, we're having arguments in our head, like we're constantly fighting with people. So look for what's consuming your time and energy in life that does not need to be. And then the third step is to plan out three weeks of exercises, each week cutting out one of those old compulsions and adding in a skill or a practice that I want to build and grow that's gonna take me in that direction that I wanna go, that I've chosen. However, it might not be immediately obvious what actions are gonna take me in that direction. This is a great place to talk to somebody or many people who have gone in that direction that you wanna go to actually understand what moves in that direction. This is also an opportunity to be open to reconsidering some big beliefs and assumptions you might have about yourself. You know, for example, I used to think that I was an introvert, but I was actually just an extrovert with really dedicated mental illness practice that kept me isolated from people. But when I started to approach the changes that I needed to make that were gonna be useful to me, a lot of the times I'd be telling myself at first, oh, well, I wouldn't do that, or I'm not the type of person who does that, or that's not something I do, I can't do that, etc." especially when I was looking at cutting out all the compulsions around social anxieties. The reality is I could do all of those things. And actually I thrive on engaging with people and building relationships and connecting with people. It's just that for so long I'd conflated the fears and anxieties with my identity. So here's an example of this. Let's say that person that was afraid of having panic attacks in public and wants to open a donut shop because they're a really great person. For the first week, they look at that logic mountain and they say, you know what? It would save me so much time and energy and it would really help me build the relationships I wanna build, reach out to people about what I wanna create if I wasn't doing all of that rereading and rewriting text messages and emails and things like that. So I'm gonna practice, first off, sending people messages. I'm just, I'm just gonna send it, I'm not gonna reread it. Huge support. And then the second week, Maybe they notice something they hadn't noticed before, but when they're on social media, they're taking photos over and over again. They're constantly spending so much time trying to find the right angle, say the right thing, etc. So they're going to practice sharing photos of their donuts, something they care about, without redoing the, the photo or the video. So they're, they're gonna do it once, they're gonna take a selfie once and post it. That will save them so much time, but that's also about them sharing themselves, sharing what they wanna do, being themselves. That's gonna be such a help for building relationships and building community. And that following week, they're gonna work on building trust in themselves, giving trust to themselves by leaving the house without needing to do all of the checking rituals to make sure they don't have stains on their clothes. After I've got three weeks of exercises laid out, something that I find so helpful is to add in a fourth week, but not at the end, add it in at the beginning and bump back all of the other exercises. The reason I find it so helpful to do that is that we aren't actually very skilled at change quite often. It's something we have avoided consistently. So just learning how to make a change can really help with then taking on a change that's gonna be a bit more distressing so what I like to do is add in that first week something that can seem almost too easy, but at the same time will seem kind of impossible. Uh, an example like that, if somebody has struggled with the fear of being judged, the exercise might be to go into a grocery store and ask somebody for something instead of looking for it. And it seems easy because you, you might say, oh, well, of, of course I can ask people for things but somebody who's afraid of being judged, who prefers to overwork rather than uh, articulating their own needs, probably does not ask for help very often. Will probably search for something for hours rather than bother somebody or admit that they don't know something. So that act of going up to somebody and asking them for something, even though you may know the answer, really starts to show our brains, hey, that I can ask people for things, I can take up space, I might inconvenience this person, they might be annoyed, they might be mean to me, they might not be nice to me, and I can handle that. 
I can have that experience. So that first week, I would just practice asking people for things. Just asking people for things. I'd go in a store, if I could see the donuts were sitting there on a shelf, I might still go to the clerk and say, hey, yeah, do, do you have any donuts? Now, if you get all this out and you're wondering, hey, but when, when do we go after the big core fears? I wanna light them up with a flamethrower. I'm gonna burn them with acid. I'm gonna blow them up with dynamite. These are all going after the core fear. Remember that person's afraid of being judged by other people. All of these are opportunities to expose themselves to that fear. They're going to risk. The brain is going to have no problem coming up with possible ways they might be judged as they take these steps out into the world to build relationships. And they have an opportunity to make it about the skills they want to build and where they want to go. There is no more terrifying exposure than actually living your life and doing the things you really want to do and risking that they might not work out, that you might get rejected, that you might actually be successful at them, and you can stop all of the delaying and procrastinating and actually be successful at the things you want to do. That's terrifying. After running through exercises like that for a week, I'd reflect on where it took me. Maybe that direction I'm moving in isn't the direction I really want to go. It's okay. I can take those steps, I can explore building those skills and practices, and then I can trust myself to see if I'm going in a direction I want to go, to see if I want to explore further. And then I would, again, I'd identify three weeks of exercises and then add in a fourth as the first week just for exploring and learning and practicing with something a bit easier. And remember, this is just an example. This is what I would do. You're going to bring in other skills and practices and experiences that are relevant to your life and your context. If you wanna share your workout plan, throw it in the comments down below. If you wanna share what you're flipping your fear to. So what did you use to avoid and control? And instead, what are you gonna grow and build? It's so useful when we focus our mental fitness practice around something we actually want to keep in our lives. So let's do that. I wonder why Suntory hasn't contacted me yet about a CC Lemon sponsorship. <laughs>